Rub up your engines! It's a 2011 Suzuki. They make phenomenal fast motorcycles. The cars weren't all that fast, and that was kind of the demise of them in the United States. But here's one that the guy uses to drive Uber around with. He bought the car from his sister, who upgraded to a RAV4, and she loves it. But he paid $3,800, and he's put over 140 thousand miles on this thing <laughs> and he's been making some serious money i think he only paid 3800 bucks for it and he hasn't put a lot of money into it either now today it's running a little bit rough so we're going to analyze it figure out why it's running rough but we'll give an overview of the whole vehicle first suzuki pulled out of the united states 10 years ago 2013. car models always are a year ahead so it's like 10 years ago the main reason as far as i'm concerned they failed is because it didn't fit the american market americans generally don't like smaller cars and believe it or not, this is one of their larger cars. They didn't have enough horsepower and they had automatic transmissions where in the rest of the world they were standard transmissions. Americans didn't like them. This is one of the last ones they sold. They pulled out in 13, this is 2011. It's a reasonable size engine. It is a two liter engine. Now, if you turbocharge this engine, you get 221 horsepower, but still that is not bad. It's got decent acceleration. You know, it's 206,000 miles on it. It doesn't burn any oil. It's running a little bit ragged, so we're gonna check that out. But overall, the vehicle's in pretty good shape. And surprising enough for me, this is actually a New York State car and it's not all rusted out. They learned how to code them by this time. After all, it is 2011. And as we look, it's not rotten. Look, you know it's been its whole life in New York State. Now, since it's got the bigger engine that they put in, the two liter, and it's all wheel drive, it's not phenomenal with gas mileage. He says he gets about 30 on a highway. Now, you saw the Forester video I did the other day. It's a bigger vehicle. It's also all wheel drive, but it got 35 miles a gallon. This engine is a bigger engine, which is strong enough. If probably, as far as I'm concerned, they would have put this bigger engine in their car from the get go, they might still be selling them in the United States because they got enough oomph. And hey, you figure $3,800, she's gone 140,000 miles. You can't really argue with that. See, it's bare bones. It's got a cloth interior. As usual, you know, the inside here is starting to go out a little bit. You can put seat covers, but it still looks good enough. And as we check the back, like I say, it's an Uber car. You can see, it's got plenty of room in the back for people to fit in and be relatively comfortable. Hilariously enough, he had a driver guy to New York City. The guy weighed over 500 pounds. So he went in the front, put the seat the whole way back. But the owner said he had a really hard time getting to the gear shift knob because the guy was taking all that space up too. And the car sank on the passenger side. And when he got out, it went back up again. It didn't damage it. You can see it's still back up. But it's running a little bit rough. So we'll get our scan tool and plug it in. So we'll plug it in onto the dash here. Turn it on and see what happens. Here we go, Suzuki, XX4, ABS. He doesn't care about that. He's interested in why it's running poorly. So we'll start with the engine powertrain. And we have... PO101, mass or airflow volume sensor performance. Well, now he had a change, but it was one of those cheapies from O'Reilly. So let's got to look at the data. We'll start it up and we'll look at live data. We'll select everything. Now you can see the fuel trim is fine. It's, it's not going rich or lean, but the long-term fuel trim, it's subtracting 7%. So it's running too rich. You can see there's nothing wrong with the timing. It's relatively stable, 10, 10 and a half. Here is the MAF sensor data. It's going at 3.4, 3.5, 3.5, 3.4. We'll watch it for a little bit, 3.2. Well, that was the easiest fix I've had in quite some time. This is a two liter engine. Therefore, it should be going at about two grams per second at idle. It's way above, plus it's vacillating up and down. One time it did go down to two, but then it went up to 3.4. You can't buy mass airflow sensors at discount auto parts stores unless they're OEM. They are so critical to the engine running. Now we found that data, so let's look at some more data just to see if anything's odd. <laughs> Battery voltage is fine, it's charging. For giggles, we're gonna look at the short-term fuel trim. Zero, zero, 1.6, 0, 0.6, 0.73. There it's at zero. Let's rev it up and see what happens. It's running rich. 
because it's subtracting fuel. Well, that was a perfect test, see? It really was subtracting 16% fuel when we rubbed it up because the mass airflow sensor is telling the stupid computer that all this air is coming in, a lot more than actually is, so it's adding too much fuel. Then the oxygen sun starts seeing, whoa, too much fuel, it's too rich. So then it's subtracting fuel. <laughs> Take my advice. Whenever you replace a mass airflow sensor, you want original equipment. Now, let's say you got a car like a BMW and that sensor's 600 bucks. Well, you were the dummy that bought the BMW. That's really your own fault. But let's say, oh, man, I, I, I can't afford that. Go to a junkyard. <laughs> they got a guarantee that they work. If you got a little scan tool like this, you can put it in the parking lot and say, Hey, look, it fixed it. You can plug it in and say, no, look, it's the wrong data. That one's no good. So you're not really taking a chance, and you can save a lot of money that way. Because if you get an aftermarket BMW mass airflow sensor, it's going to work incorrectly. I have never seen one of those on a BMW that ever worked correctly if it wasn't an OEM Bosch unit. They're so particular about the information coming in. And in this case, it's one of those O'Reilly cheapies from China, and uh, they don't work all the time. I would not put one in. Believe me, it's not worth a headache. Now, obviously, it's a simple job. Here's the air filter, and there's the mass airflow. It unplugs. Take the two screws and plug it in. Just make sure you put the plug end here and don't put it backwards over here. That's all you have to do, but you can see. It's just got one of these barcodes. It is not OEM. It is a Chinese made one and it isn't working right. And in the case of this car, it doesn't need any kind of reprogram either. You can go buy one, take it out, unplug it, unscrew it, put a new one, plug it in. And then yes, it will recalibrate itself. Give it a day or two. The best way to calibrate them yourself, if you really want to do it is you put it in, you start up the car. Get in the car with everything turned off except the engine and rev it to about 2,000 RPMs for 10 minutes. Just sit there. If it's hot, put a big fan in front of the car. Then put the AC on, do the same thing. Put it at 2,000 RPM for about 10 minutes, then drive it. You'll probably find it will equilibrate itself and run fine. If not, eh, drive it around a couple of days and it'll set itself up. These do not need any type of reset. No, he says he hears the noise, so let's close the hood. Take it out, it might have a bad wheel bearing in the front. Now for an engine with over 200,000 miles, hey, it still sounds pretty quiet. Now these are little cars, so of course when we hit the bumpy Rhode Island roads, yeah, you know, you can hear clogging and feel it. It's not horrible, it's a small little car, but that's one of the reasons Americans didn't like them because they're kind of bumpy little cars and Americans like big giant monstrosities. They really don't care that much about gas mileage. At least they didn't used to. He's swerving left, right, he's swerving left, and I can hear the noise. That means the left front wheel bearing is a little bit warm. It's nothing outrageous. I mean, the car's got 206,000 miles on it. But if he wants to do preventive maintenance, he could change the left front wheel bearing. And since it's a New York State car, basically, I'd probably change both front wheel bearings. Then you wouldn't have to think about it. Right, it's getting hot, even in Rhode Island. The AC's nice and cool. It's a fact, it's still got the cool little vent windows. Now, they don't open, but you get to see, so you can see what's going on. I, I like the style. A $3,800 Suzuki, 140,000 miles later, is still running okay. Mind you, the idle's off because it's got a cheap O'Reilly Chinese made mass airflow sensor. He's going to get an original equipment one, so it'll run better, but he's driven it all that miles. The engine does not burn oil, even now, because it's not a little bitty three-cylinder engine. It's a two-liter four-cylinder engine, and in this case, it's non-turbocharged, so it's going to last quite some time. Now, yeah, they pulled out of the United States with cars 2013, but the rest of the world, hey, a lot of them are still driving Suzuki's around. You get good gas mileage. They can last quite some time if you change the oil. He changes this every five, and it doesn't burn any oil. As long as you take care of it, it could last quite some time. And of course, you can get them dirt cheap in the United States because they pulled out 10 years ago. Just heed one warning. If you need some major parts, you're going to be spending some time hunting around to find them in the United States. You might be doing the junkyard tour for a while. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Dave Palmtree says, hey, I'm looking into a 2018 Ford Mustang EcoBoost with a 10-speed automatic and four-cylinder, 40 to 70,000 miles. I've heard... It gets a 2.5 to 5 out of reliability. But Reddit says it's reliable. Okay, well, don't listen to Reddit. That stuff's a bunch of made-up crap anyways. <laughs> 
they are very unreliable as they age. You got a little four cylinder engine, puts out 300 something horsepower, has turbocharger, has gasoline direct injection, pressure, pressure, pressure in the engine, and it's a Ford. There's a lot of plastic parts on them. I've had people buy them in the beginning, they loved them. And then when they got to be older, they hated them because they cost a ton of money to fix. That's just what it is. And I hate that 10 speed automatic on that particular vehicle. With a the standard, they're fun. Those, they're always going up and down and around. And no, I would not buy that car with that EcoBoost engine. The main reason they put it in, I believe the engine's made in Spain, is because the Europeans have rules pretty much against V8 engines. They tax the heck out of them, but they don't the four cylinder engines. So that's why. They really went to that engine because they never did sell Mustangs in Europe until a few years ago, and they brought that engine out mainly to sell them in Europe. It's a European thing. It's not an American thing. You want a Mustang in the United States? Get a V8. Don't get that EcoBoost. They have problems, and you're talking about buying a used one. Who knows how the previous owner abused it? I would not buy one. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.